Hello and welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben and today we are going to break down the most daring ship maneuvers in the expanse. And you will leave this video feeling smarter, stronger, and all around better about your life. Okay, not true at all, but this video is a good idea. British Ben actually thought of it, so I suppose we have to give him and the Queen some credit here. Though I do so reluctantly. Anyway, we've done a lot of touchy-feely videos on The Expanse. You know, the ones in which I offered in-depth analyses of some of the show's main characters. Watch those damn videos if you haven't yet, please. But alas, some of you are more into the show for its visuals and action. So today I'm leaving my amateur psychologist cap to the side, and we're going to talk about cool spaceship stuff. Because while the show indeed has deep characters, a great conflict, and tons of memorable dialogue, it also does space battles and void chases really well. And so today we present you with a list of riskiest ship maneuvers that have been executed throughout the course of the show. But first, stop what you're doing. Don't even breathe. Well, at least for the next minute and a half while I talk about today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Have you taken down the Demon Lord yet? Well, if not, then, well then what are you really doing with your life? Just stop. Quit college, quit your job or whatever, and download Raid so you can explore its endless array of dungeons filled with heathenous hordes of all sorts. Saito, no one is scared of you. Our world has guns. Anyway, I love playing Raid, sifting through all of the champion's different skill sets in order to build a team worthy of the bevy of beasts you'll find in Teleria is never-ending addictive fun. Raid actually just passed their two-year anniversary, and now the game is bigger and better than ever. And now, using a special feature, you can actually install the game into your mind via chip. Just kidding. But they just had a month and a half of awesome events and tournaments, and the fun and mayhem shows no signs of slowing down anytime soon. This month, they're going to release a bunch of new epic champions, and plenty more are on the way in the near future. Oh, and the second rotation of the Doom Tower has also just been introduced, and it contains all sorts of sweet prizes to win for facing its inner evils with Valiance. But if you choose to ascend its cursed heights, then do know you will be expected to try your hand against the Celestial Griffin and the Eternal Dragon, both brutal bosses laying waste to champions galore at this very moment. All you have to do is hit the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen right now and you're on your way to a heck of a time. As a new player, you'll get a free epic champion, my boy Jotun, and a bunch of other goodies compliments of the house. But these extras will only be in your inbox for the next 30 days. So get going, click that link, and get into the game. Now back to today's video. In ninth place, we have Chasing the Giant Space Potato. At the end of the first season, the crew of the Rasanante fled Eros, a giant near-Earth asteroid, and the site of Eros Station, a joint UN-MCR protectorate which had just experienced a massive protomolecule outbreak. Well, come season two, they needed to figure out a way to contain the dangerous element to the asteroid and thus prevent a system-wide catastrophe. Their original plan was simple. Steal the Nauvoo, a gargantuan colony ship owned by a group of Mormons, and fly it into Eros, thereby knocking it into the sun and destroying it. The mission crew dropped off Miller and Diogo, two brave belters, on the asteroid so they could plant bombs on it in order to blow up the station and thus prevent further entry into the protomolecule infested place ere it dissolves into a giant ball of fire. However, when a damn humanitarian aid ship came flying by and refused to turn around, the Rasanante blew it up. Perhaps a bit quick, but hey, existential threats call for extreme action. And the debris from the explosion ended up damaging one of the bombs, necessitating that Miller stay behind and press a button on it every few minutes in order to stop it from detonating prematurely. To make matters worse, the Nauvoo failed to impact Eros as the asteroid actually moved out of the way and began to pick up speed on a trajectory towards Earth. Now, of course, we all know of Miller's heroics in preventing the worst from happening. But for a while, the crew of the Rossi, led by esteemed pilot Alex Kamal, was risking its life in the hopes of saving Miller after he plants the bomb. Alex and crew burned at unfathomable speed, well, if you consider somewhere around 20 Gs unfathomable, for quite a few minutes, putting enormous pressure on their bodies and perhaps breaking new speed records for man. Of course, on Miller's imploring, they eventually let up and fell back. In 8th place, we have to give some credit to the bad guys. Here we have the Amun-Ra Stealth Frigate Attack on the Donager. 
The Amun-Ra-class stealth frigate, as we've detailed in a video on this channel, was an extremely capable ship. After all, it was commissioned by Protogen, a private Earth-based bioweaponry company that's part of the larger Mao Kwiatkowski mercantile conglomerate. The Amun-Ra-class was known for its Black Ops hyper-cooled Epstein Drive codenamed Silversmith, which I assume was optimized for stealth capabilities. Meanwhile, the Doniger, captained by Teresa Ya, was the flagship of the Martian Navy's Jupiter fleet, and presumably one of the most powerful and durable ships in the Sol system. So despite the advanced tech built into the Amun-Ra, going after the Doniger was risky business, but they did so using fairly clever tactics. A group of six Amun-Ra frigates flew extremely close to each other, making themselves appear as a single entity, and then when in striking distance, split up and commenced firing on the Doniger. Ultimately, I think that Captain Yao didn't properly prepare for this battle because the strength of her ship made her a bit arrogant. Thus, I believe that the Protogen ships chanced that she wouldn't be paying too close attention to their behaviors as they closed in on the Martian vessel. What mostly made their attack risky, though, was that the Doniger could really handle itself in close quarters battle. So getting within striking distance of it didn't mean victory for the Amun Ra's. And indeed, they lost four of their six ships. But this was all part of the plan. They figured they'd sacrifice a few ships, but as long as they could get one or two to survive up until the Doniger could be breached, then their plan would be successful. The Doniger came close to knocking them all out, but ultimately an Amun Ra or two pulled through and Yao scuttled her ship. In seventh place, we have Maneo's pioneering headfirst dive into the Ring Gate. Midway through season three, the Soul Ring Gate had just been formed out of the protomolecule entity that emerged out of Venus, and no one had any idea what it was or if it could be passed through, and no one was daring enough to try to go near it. Enter a bold belter by the name of Maneo Jung Espinoza, a man known for his prowess in slingshot racing, an illegal and highly dangerous sport mostly practiced by belters, which involves pilots launching themselves in one-person crafts into space on a precisely calculated course using a single thrust of engine power. The pilot's course then swings him into the proximity of the gravity wells of a planet or other astronomical body, which boosts the velocity of a ship in the hopes of achieving the best time across the plotted circuit. When Maneo's girlfriend dumped him, he became eager to accomplish greater and greater feats in order to impress her and win her back. And when slingshots wouldn't do the trick, Maneo set his sights on bigger prizes. In the name of love and with supreme valiance and absolute stupidity, he headed for the Soul Gate. But as he entered it, a barrier appeared, instantly decelerating his ship to a halt. And well, you don't want to see what happened to Maneo. Let's just say he didn't make it. In sixth place, we have yet another high G burn with the rescue of Naomi. So this one all started towards the end of season five with Naomi waking up on the Chetsamoka, a fuel transport freighter in Marco Inaros's employ, and which Naomi had jumped to from Inaros's ship, the Pella, sans a spacesuit in order to escape his cold clutches. Guys, please don't make me tell you not to jump into the vacuum without a spacesuit. It's not smart. There was a few problems though. First, she had no food or water. She had a limited and depleting air supply, and worst of all, the entire ship had been rigged to trap and destroy the Rasanante. Inaros's men had programmed a suit on the ship to send out a fake distress call in the sound of Naomi's voice, which hopefully the Rossi would pick up. And James Holden being James Holden, he hopefully wouldn't hesitate before coming to rescue his part-time significant other. And when the Rossi showed up, a proximity trigger would detonate the bombs on board the Chets and thus take out Jimmy and his crew. Luckily, however, the real Naomi was actually on the ship and she discovered the ploy. She thus set about trying to thwart her friends from coming to save her by altering the distress call. However, Alex and Bobby on the Razorback ended up receiving the fake distress call and notified Holden. Holden requested that Alex and Bobby go to save Naomi while he distracted Inaros on the Rossi. 
Alex, ever the committed team member, vowed to get Naomi back, and he and Bobby strapped in and initiated a high G burn en route to the Chetsamoka. Just before the Razorback got too close though, Naomi was able to activate one of its thrusters, thus changing its course and grabbing the attention of Alex and Bobby. However, when the Razorback wouldn't back off, Naomi jumped out of the Chets, in a spacesuit thankfully this time, and attempted to avert Alex using hand signals, which she was successful in doing, and the Razorback slowed out of high G burn and headed for Naomi and not the bombship. The risk was incurred by multiple parties here, but most so by Naomi in setting the Chets into thrust and jumping out of the ship, and by Alex and Bobby who burned at high speed into an unknown and possibly dangerous situation, though it was the pressure of Hygie itself which bore the heaviest consequence. In fifth place, we have the Rossi Barbapicola Tethering. In the middle of season four, due to some sort of protomolecular magic, one of the islands on Illus blew up in a thermonuclear explosion, sending a shockwave across the entire planet and causing a host of other natural disasters to ensue. This chain of events resulted in the power going out in all of the ships in Illus' orbit, including in the Rosinante and the Barba Piccola, a salvaged Belter ship. Thus, all of such ships had to act fast as eventually they would plummet into the atmosphere below, which would be a worse outcome for the Barb than for the Rossi, as the former wasn't rated for atmosphere. The crew of the Rossi then went about trying to figure out how to prevent the Barba Piccola from falling to its doom. At first, they thought to just rescue everyone on the ship, but Lucia, a belter inhabitant of Illus, pointed out that they needed to actually save the ship, being that it contained all of the lithium they had mined, a valuable element in the time of the Expanse. Thanks to Alex's blabbing, Lucia came up with an idea. They could attempt to hitch the Barba Piccola to the Rasinante and pull it into higher orbit. They thus took apart the Barb's mining nets and used the materials to create a long cable capable of connecting the two ships at a safe distance. Of course, this plan would bear great risk to the crews of both ships. If the cable snapped, then the plan would fail and there would be no more time to save the people on board the Barb. And of course, a malfunction of any sort would cause the Rossi to be dragged down with the Belter ship. However, despite the process of hitching the ships together being tense, they were able to connect them via the cable and save the Barb along with its crew. In fourth place, we have the boarding of the Pazuza, though I don't really like to bring this event up as the media will surely use it to attempt to defame our dear leader, Christian of Vassarala. Late in season four, Marco Inaros attempted an attack on Earth's defenses using the Sojourner, a UN colony ship he hijacked. In response, the UN-OPA alliance set their sights on tracking Inaros down. OPA leaders Kamina Drummer and Kleis Ashford, holy be his name, were able to track Inaros to the Pazuza, a civilian belter ship which hadn't made any stops since an image of Inaros was captured on board. UN Secretary General Christian of Vassarala got wind of this information and her military commanders laid out her options. She could order a missile strike on the Pazuza and thus ensure the ship and all aboard were destroyed while incurring little risk, or they could execute a tactical boarding operation using UN Marines. The latter option would of course be a much bigger risk as they could be headed into a trap, and in any case, they couldn't know how the passengers on board would react to the Marines. Nonetheless, Avasarala opted for the boarding operation and the Marines were ambushed and killed and the Pazuza was blown up. Where is Admiral Akbar when you need him? Still, the boarding of the Pazuza was one of the cooler operations in the show. In third place, we have Alex's piloting during the Battle of Thoth Station. In between the Eros incident and the Eros chase, the crew of the Rossi was dead set on taking down the people who were at fault for the outbreak on Eros, i.e. protogen scientists and minions. They tracked the source of said outbreak to Thoth Station, a ring-shaped deep space outpost guarded by a single Amon Ra stealth fighter, and they made plans to attack it. Now, the odds were really against the Rossi and their Belter friends in this mission. All of the characters involved barely knew each other and had little time to develop chemistry before undertaking this dangerous operation. Furthermore, aside from their small team, the Thoth assault crew would have no outside help as they didn't know who to trust and on the flip side, the Martian and Earth governments viewed them as possible enemies. Then, Thoth Station itself was no easy target. It was run by Protogen, a powerful company boasting all sorts of advanced tech and weaponry. Thus, they had to employ a risky strategy based on misdirection. First, the Rasinante hid behind an OPA cargo ship known as the Guy Molinari on approach to Thoth. 
and when in appropriate proximity to the station, it pulled away and went into freefall towards it, acting as a loose cargo container. While they probably didn't expect to fool Protogen's forces stationed there for long, the little trick was intended to take their attention away from a couple of actual cargo containers filled with the assault team, which were then launched at the station, one of which was destroyed, and the other of which made it safely to its destination, thus allowing the team aboard to take the station. However, the reason for the mission's success was due to Alex Kamal's death-defying maneuvers at the helm of the Rasa Nante. The Rossi had absorbed some fire from the Amun Ra frigate patrolling the station, and as a result, one of its thrusters was damaged. This forced Alex to retreat under the station, where he weaved in and out of confined spaces while at the same time holding the attention of the Amun Ra without allowing it to hit the Rossi with any more of its firepower. When the Rossi's thruster was finally fixed, in a scintillating display of flying mastery, Alex popped out from under the station and took out the station's anti-asteroid cannon and then to the Amun-Ra ship using what I've previously termed a freefall directional thrust hybrid drunken master technique. In second place, we have the Flippin' Burn Escape. In the middle of the third season, the Rasanante ran into some undue trouble when a fake message of Holden was broadcast to all ships in the vicinity of the Ringgate, in which he appeared to take credit for the destruction of the Sungu, a UNN ship which in actuality had been taken out by Clarissa Mao, daughter of Jules Pierre Mao, the owner of Mao Kukowski Mercantile, as well as its subsidiary protege. On the OPAS behemoth, Kamina Drummer and Kleiss Ashford were discussing how to respond. Eventually, they decided to fire missiles at the Rossi so as to clearly disavow James Holden's actions and avoid any sort of hostilities with Earth. Thus, the crew of the Rocinante had to act fast in order to survive. As Alex got the Rossi on the move, Holden tried to consult with the Miller apparition in order to perhaps discover some secrets as to the workings of the protomolecule and rings, and thereby determine what to do. As the behemoth's missiles grew closer, Holden frantically instructed Alex to head for the ring gate, but to come to a full stop just before it and slowly decelerate the rest of the way through. With the missile in tow, Alex entered the Rossi into a high-G burn, and on a dime right before the gate, he flipped the ship and seamlessly transitioned into decel, making it through the protomolecule barrier just before the missile made impact. Finally, in first place, we have the EM Cover Flippin' Strike. This is the maneuver that gets talked about the least, but it's perhaps the most daring of all, and the coolest. It all began when Bobby and Avasarala fled the Guanxian in the Razorback. They quickly found themselves on the run in high G from a closing UN ship seeking to destroy them. Meanwhile, the crew of the Rocinante received a distress call from the Razorback, and after a short argument over whether or not to answer the ship's call for help, they decided to race to the scene. The Rossi arrived just when the UN ship was in strike range of the Razorback and had fired its missiles, which the Rossi countered with missiles of its own. However, the comparatively small frigate was no match for the UNN ship, and it thus had to get creative in order to have a shot at victory. So this is what the crew of the Rossi did. They fired a bunch of missiles towards the UNN ship, but detonated them well before, causing a large explosion, which the Rossi raced towards and used as cover against the UNN vessel. As it passed through the blast, Alex flipped the Rossi around, decelerated towards the enemy ship, and when in position, fired a couple of missiles at its engines, thus disabling it. Not bad for a guy who couldn't hack it in the Martian Navy. Anyways, that's our list of the top nine most daring ship maneuvers in the expanse. I hope you enjoyed this video and a little bit of a break from my face. If you did, please do give the video a big thumbs up. Uh, remember to comment down below. Let me know any maneuvers that I missed. Subscribe to this channel and hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben. I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.